This week on The Destination Angler. He was always resentful of the East. This is just this is the other side of my dad. I mean, he had a rough side, a very rough side. And uh, he didn't like, you know, the, the moneyed, preppy kind of guys. So he had those two sides to him. Uh, and they were both very much there, high profile, when they happened. He, he could be a wonderful man. I loved fishing with him. Even when he was rough on me, which he was, and I just would do anything to go fishing with him and George and my Uncle Ken. Uh, those are the happiest memories I have. That's John McLean on his dad, Norman McLean. Welcome to the Destination Angler Podcast, the podcast for anglers who travel. And I'm your host, Steve Haig. We go right to the source, the local guides and experts, to build your knowledge of top fishing locations around North America. It's a big world out there. Now go and fish it. I'm going away for a while. But I'll be back soon. Hey, anglers, welcome back to part two of the Destination Angler on the Blackfoot River, brought to you by Angler's Coffee, perfecting the coffee experience for the fly fishing community and anglers everywhere with small batch coffee delivered to your doorstep. It's darn near perfect. By Got Fishing, crafting world-class fly fishing adventures specially designed to your level of experience and budget. By Trout Routes, the number one fishing app, helping you find new trout waters so you spend less time on the road and more time doing what you love, trout fishing. And by Adams Built Fishing Gear, the trusted source for quality fly fishing gear built to last at an affordable price. Up next on the Destination Angler, we head east to the Deerfield River in northwestern Massachusetts. After that, we spend some time with competition angler Josh Miller, head of the USA Youth Fly Fishing Program on the Little Juniata River in central Pennsylvania. And be sure to backcast to catch part one of the Blackfoot River with John McLean. You won't want to miss these shows. If you like the show, be sure to hit that subscribe button and tell a buddy. And today our destination is part two of our conversation with John McLean on the Blackfoot River. In case you missed part one, John is the son of Norman McLean, the author of the book that changed everything. A river runs through it. Hey, if you love the book and the movie, this episode is for you. Now, in his early 80s, John opens up about the book, the movie, and the McLean family like never before. Ever wondered what Norman McLean was like as a father? Or what he might have thought about the movie? We unravel the enigma of his brother Paul probing into the mystery surrounding his life and tragic end. But that's not all. We also shed light on the real-life counterpart of Neil, the preppy and obnoxious brother of Jesse, and learn that the opening scene in the original manuscript was totally different. Stay with us to the very end for John's captivating tales of his journeys as a reporter alongside Henry Kissinger and his profound insights into the unforgettable closing words of the book, I'm Haunted by Waters. A little bit about John. He's an acclaimed author and journalist in his own right, having spent 18 years as a Washington correspondent for the Chicago Tribune and now as a freelance writer. His latest book, Home Waters, A Chronicle of Family and a River, is a great read that I highly recommend. All right, now let's hear from John. John, I want to read the opening paragraph of your dad's book for everybody. And I, I, if, if you're an angler listening to this show, I, I bet there's a good chance that you've read this. But it, it's it's a fantastic piece of American prose in my mind. And I'm just really wondering what comes to your mind as I read this. In our family, there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing. We lived at the junction of great trout rivers in western Montana. And our father was a Presbyterian minister and a fly fisherman who tied his own flies and taught others. He told us about Christ's disciples being fishermen, and we were left to assume, as my brother and I did, that all first-class fishermen on the Sea of Galilee were fly fishermen, that John the Favorite was a dry fly fisherman. <laughs> I just love that. <laughs> what, where did that come from, and what, do, what, do, what are your thoughts as I read that? Oh, Lord, I mean, it's, it's an inspired piece of writing, and it, sure is. it sums up a lifetime. The hand script, uh, the writing of it, is interesting because uh, he'd scratched out the opening sentence that he had written. My father wrote by hand, very difficult handwriting. Uh, generations of typists prided themselves on being able to, to decipher it. And then in handwritten right above it is that in my family, there was no clear line between huh, religion really? and fly fishing. Yeah. So it came late. It was inspired writing. It is exactly what you said. 
It's one of the great paragraphs of American literature. Can I ask what was the opening line that was scratched out? I don't remember. Okay. It was kind of pedestrian. <laughs> oh, was it? Just kind of boring. Yeah, and it's been 30 year, more than 30 years since I saw it. And I've never seen them display that. The University of Chicago Library, the Regenstein Library, has it. And it would be interesting to see that displayed. So a little footnote here. I actually contacted the University of Chicago Library, and they say that McLean played with the opening scene of the book. In the original, the two brothers are discussing taking Norman's brother-in-law, Neil, fishing. And it begins, My brother said to me, he's just as welcome as a dose of gonorrhea. I said to my brother, go easy on him. He's my brother-in-law. My brother said, I won't fish with him. He comes from the West Coast and he fishes with worms. McLean did not scratch the line out, but he did pencil in the margin, use later. The now famous opening line, in our family there was no clear line between religion and fly fishing, appears later on page four of the draft. And McLean penciled in, begin here at the top of the page. The same manuscript draft has an alternate title that is scratched out. And this might be what John was remembering. The title Fly Fishing is scratched out and underneath is written A River Runs Through It. So there you have it, folks. Super interesting. Uh, two people, and I, I'm not to uh, current on their names, have spent 10 years researching how A River Runs Through It came to be. You know, they're academic researchers and they should answer that question. Yeah, I guess. And their work is going to come out within the next year or two. I mean, these, you never know exactly on these things, but it's a very serious effort, and, and I'm looking forward to seeing it. Uh, 2025 is the uh, 50th anniversary of the publication of A River Runs Through It, and there are going to be things like that long in the making. Uh, they're going to be popping up. And it should be an interesting time. How did the book come about? Can you walk us through that? Because your dad was retired. Uh, he was an older gentleman. He really didn't do a lot of writing before this. Give us that story. All that is correct. He always wanted to be a writer his whole life and thought of himself as a writer and treated himself as a writer, but he hadn't written more than occasional pieces, a magazine, the odd short magazine piece. They're collected in a book called The Norman MacLean Reader that has never done well. Uh, there just isn't enough to it. Uh, and he felt that acutely. A number of things happened. My mother died, uh, and he was bereft. He had some very serious health problems and came to a point where he realized that if things continued as they were, he was going to die unfulfilled. And he decided not to do that. And it was a mental decision that had all these consequences and it was kind of miraculous. I mean, he had real trouble. And he shook it off like a duck dog, shaking off water, and settled down and wrote A River Runs Through It. He wrote the other stories, the stories in the back of it came first. Okay. And as he said, he was forever creeping up on the story of his brother which is his passion. That's the igniting passion. He was always trying to write that story. And the stories in the back uh, were supposed to be about that, and they weren't. Yeah. And he, as he described it, and I, uh, I'm sure it'll be more full once this uh, study comes out, but as he described it, he finally looked at it and said, I haven't done it. And if I'm going to do it, I'm going to have to be direct. And that's a river runs through it. Yeah, yeah. Did his father inspire him to write this? I feel like I read something about that, that his father said, you always write. Well, he inspired him to to be to greatness. And <laughs> that's in home waters. <laughs> I mean, you know, he was always saying, be great, be great, be great. Oh, really? Well, now what you're doing is not great. That's no good. <laughs> be great, be great. And, it, you know, <laughs> it will drive you nuts. Yeah. Because there's all this pressure to be something great. Whatever you tried, nah, that ain't it. <laughs> yeah. So that finally it worked. My dad talks about it in A River Runs Through It, where his father tells him, you know, you've got to try a story sometime where you deal with it realistically, and then you'll begin to understand uh, what's happened, which is very telling. Yeah. It informs you that the reverend, who by then had lost Paul, uh, realized that there was something that needed to be explained. 
that this was not just normal family life and, oh, by the way, by accident we lost somebody. That isn't the way it happened. This was something with very, very deep undercurrents that needed to be explored. And I think that that is the the underlayment uh, of that exchange between Norman and uh, John Norman. And uh, he had trouble finding a publisher, didn't he? Well, that's not quite the way it happened. I finally got tired of all the guessing about that and got all the documents on that together. And I'd like to find somebody to deal with it. I assume that these people who are doing this study are going to deal with that. There's a lot of exchanges, and you're not left in doubt in the end how it happened. Norman had a champion at the University of Chicago Press, and he wanted to publish A River Runs Through It. But the press had never published any fiction, and he knew that there would be opposition. So he very cleverly figured out that if you got a rejection from an East Coast publisher, that that would inflame passions uh, on the faculty, staff, and committee who made these decisions for the University of Chicago Press, and that they would allow it to go forward. So he kind of engineered a uh, rejection, and the East Coast uh, complied. There you go. Uh, there was a very fine editor at Alfred Knopf on the East Coast who read it and wrote back a note and said, you know, it's, it's very well written, it's a beautiful book, but it's not saleable. And we're turning it down. And that's all that it took. You know, there wasn't rejection after rejection. That's not true. There wasn't a big push to get it, uh, somebody in the East to do this. Because this guy didn't want the East to publish it. He wanted to publish it and eventually did. Okay. And uh, that's how it came to be. Then there's the afterlife of that, where another editor at uh, Alfred Knopf writes my dad saying, gee, we loved your book, and if you've got anything else, I'd uh, love to see it. And, Send it my way. And publish it. And my father wrote back this <laughs> very angry letter, which oh. finishes up saying, if Alfred Knopf were the last publisher in the world and I were the last author, that would be the end of books. <laughs> Right. Now, he liked to be angry. He liked to do that kind of thing. Oh, did he? Oh, interesting. Yeah, but it, it, it's a sad story in some ways because the editor who approached him and said about to publish your book was a big fan, didn't realize that this this previous rejection had happened and just walked into oh. the lion's den oh, <laughs> and God. got devoured. Got the wrath of your dad there. So what was your dad like? Well, he was a very interesting character, and he was a character. And he played that character. Uh, you know, you got to figure this is a guy from the backwoods of uh, Montana who had gotten a very fine education and had been up to it. Right. At Dartmouth College and from his father. Yeah. I mean, he'd been trained in classic British literature and had done very well at Dartmouth. In fact, he had done brilliantly. Uh, he'd been the editor of the Jack O' Lantern for a couple of years. His pal, on the Jack O'Lantern was a man who became Dr. Seuss. Yeah, man, all that's great. Wonderful books. That's fantastic. And they, they put out the Jack O'Lantern together almost two handed. He was well regarded and stayed on for over a year as a teaching assistant at Dartmouth. He was always resentful of the East. This is just this the other side of my dad. I mean, he had a rough side, a very rough side. And uh, he didn't like, you know, the, the moneyed, preppy kind of guys. Prided himself on ha having never sent a, a donation to Dartmouth. Oh, really? Dartmouth he brags about uh, the high rate of uh, alumni donations, and he'd never done it. But when uh, a young writer from a Dartmouth college magazine called him up and said, I'd like to interview you, you know, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Okay. Uh, uh, so he had those two sides to him, uh, and they were both very much there, high profile, when they happened. He, he could be a wonderful man. I loved fishing with him, even when he was rough on me, which he was. I, mean, I just would do anything to go fishing with him and no George kidding. and my Uncle Ken. Uh, and those are the happiest memories I have. And I wrote about some of them uh, in home waters, especially that first fishing trip my, uh, my dad took me on. And he could do that. He could just take a simple, ordinary little thing, fishing trip, <clears throat> a day on a river, uh, an experience like that, and make it absolutely 
magical. Really? How so? Well, read his writing. That's how he did it. I mean, yeah. you know, it became magic. It had things added to it that you never saw there. It became mystical. It became loving. It became glowing. And he could do that and he could do it with people when he felt like doing it. And as I say, he had a very rough side. Where do you suppose the rough side came from? Because it sounds like Missoula was very rough. Oh, I think his father was a, 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 quite a character. Oh, really? I used to talk to people who knew him, who were my father's contemporaries. I said, geez, the stories I hear about this guy is he was a real rough piece of work. Really? Said, oh, no. The Presbyterian minister? No, that's not, yeah, no, no. He was <laughs> very companionable. We used to go fishing with him. We had a whole circle of young guys from the church, and we would go fishing with the Reverend McLean, and he was kind of our leader, and we adored him, and everything was hunky-dory. But things were not always hunky-dory. I mean, he was come up from a very rough farm upbringing. And like my father, he had, uh, you know, found learning, found his way out of that through learning. Right. Uh, he was born in Nova Scotia. And I think he got out of there partly for health reasons because uh, upper respiratory illnesses are a, a family um, problem. And wound up in Manitoba, at the University of Manitoba, studying theology and riding the circuit and that's where he met his wife, who's in Manitoba. Okay. You know, he was a farm guy. He hunted and fished for food all his life. He built our cabin. Uh, you know, log cabins are not supposed to last 100 years, and ours has, because he was a very, very fine carpenter. I guess. But he was very precise and to the point of dogmatic about how things were to be done. Everything had to be done very precisely. And uh, the image that everybody's father had is you cannot use this baseball glove until you have used wax on it and oil and made it into the right shape and left it for several days <laughs> to take on the right shape. You can't catch a ball with this until you do all that. Isn't first. that funny? <laughs> well, you say in the book, I, I highlight this because in the book it talks about, your dad talks about, about his father who says, if our father had his say, nobody who did not know how to fish would be allowed to disgrace a fish by catching him. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and it was very high-minded. And yeah. he was deeply loved in that community, oh, uh, really? the Reverend okay. was in Missoula. I mean, he was a leading figure in that community, uh, and he was, well, the church there, the Presbyterian Church, still to this day, uh, has many of the elite of Missoula, you know, the, the bankers, the publishers, the, the people who are really doing heavy-duty community stuff, and that's the way it was at the time. A.J. Gibson, the great architect, was a parishioner and a great friend of, of uh, the Reverend and Mrs. McLean, and he's the one who's did the daily uh, estate in the Bitterroot Valley. He did the county building in uh, Missoula and lots and lots of other things. He was a wonderful architect. Okay. In the movie, it, it kind of makes your grandfather out to be kind of a boring preacher. But did you ever hear him preach? No, he was gone by the time I came along. But I have studied his uh, okay some of his sermons and, in fact, reproduced one entire in uh, Home Waters. There was a box we had with his sermons in it, uh, now lost. And I looked through some of those when I was a young kid, and they looked like semi-conventional, but he was capable of, of real eloquence. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, the one where he, that I, it isn't a sermon, the one that I reproduced, it's a eulogy for the Gibsons, A.J. and Maud Gibson. And they were killed in a terrible accident. I was struck by a railroad train on a crossing oh, in Missoula. Yeah. Well, if you read the eulogy, uh, it takes some of the sting out of that. It's a wonderful thing. Yeah. Uh, he was retired by then, and he came over from Helena. Where, well, he had retired. He'd left Missoula. He hadn't retired. He was working in Helena as the secretary of the Presbyterian Church for Missoula for Hel. I'm sorry, Montana and Wyoming, the Synod. Uh, and he came over to, to deliver that eulogy. Oh, no kidding. Then when he retired, he finally went back to Missoula and lived there to the end of his life. So he was a formidable figure I'd, and a very interesting one. I, yeah, I've tried very hard to recapture him. Right. Hey, anglers. You've heard me talking about Angler's Coffee for quite some time now. 
And I have a question for you. Have you tasted it yet? Well, if you have, then you know what I'm talking about. It's darn good coffee, isn't it? Hey, if you're like me, tasting's believing. And believe me, this coffee tastes great. My wife and I are hooked on it. Angler's Coffee offers an impressive spectrum of flavor profiles, so there's something for everyone. You know, when you're spending a day on the water, you need a great cup of coffee to carry you through, like the Coachman's Blend. Named after the famous Royal Coachman, you'll love the design of the bag as much as the coffee. This blend of medium and dark roasted coffee from Central and South America produces a flavorful and smooth cup with notes of chocolate and baking spices and a smooth finish. Order some today and save 10% with a custom subscription like I did. You pick the coffee blends you want, and they're delivered right to your doorstep. And if you're not 100% satisfied, they'll give you your money back, no questions asked. No kidding. A percentage of each sale goes to some great nonprofit organizations in the fly fishing community. So put a smile on your face, just like I did, and give it a cast. That's Angler's Coffee. Tastings Believing. With so much information out there, it can get darn right confusing and even overwhelming to find the right fishing adventure. Sorting through all the options and fees can be quite the headache. Well, not anymore. I'm super excited to introduce Got Fishing. Got Fishing is a boutique booking agency for world-class fishing adventures around the world. They ensure that you are on the exact fishing trip that meets your skill level, budget, and desired experience. Whether you're a seasoned angler or new to the sport, Got Fishing's personalized service will help you decide which adventure is the best fit for you, your group, or even your business. Worry about fees? Worry no more. With Got Fishing, you won't pay anything extra because their services are entirely free for you. You see, Got Fishing exclusively partners with highly reputable outfitters who gladly compensate them for their services, ensuring a win-win situation. Explore the range of fishing adventures and learn more about the services Got Fishing provides at gotfishing.com. That's www.gotfishing.com. And check them out on Instagram, too. Let me read something else that you wrote. This is off your website. My family, which was British and Scotch and reserved in the expressions of its emotions, especially in any emotions about loving, didn't talk about how much we loved each other. It would have been unthinkable. But fishing was the one place where we could say how much we admired each other. And I wanted to ask you about that because tell us about this word beautiful that your grandfather used so much, especially, to, I think, to describe Paul. Yes. Yes, always used to describe Paul as though it uh, exonerated him from his bad behavior. I don't know exactly where it came from. I think it came from an early appreciation of literature. He got very lucky in Nova Scotia. He wound up at a place called the Pictou Academy, in Pictou of all places. And it was run by a Presbyterian minister who did not have theology as a standard course. Uh, He didn't teach theology formally. If you wanted to study theology, he would do that. He was a minister, but you would do it privately. Uh, What he did with the curriculum was make it a classical uh, learning curriculum based on the University of Edinburgh, which at that time was one of the great scientific institutions in the world. So you got a science education, natural sciences. The minister who ran it was a collector and a natural scientist and had a wonderful museum collection of birds and critters. Uh, John James Audubon stopped there on the way back from his trip to famous trip to Labrador and was astounded at some of the things that this guy had in his collection. And the guy just opened up the case and said, here, you, you know, you take them with you. Very generous really? guy. And huh. I think that that place, Pictou Academy, had a big effect uh, on the Reverend. At least I've told myself that. And, you know, I, I have to invent some of this. But he was there and that happened. And they had access to the finest British writers. And when my dad talks about his education from his father, that's who he's reading. You know, he's not reading what we think of as world literature. He's not reading Sanskrit uh, or Homer, (laughs) even. He's reading the Brits. Yeah. Uh, And that's where that came from. Okay. And the the concept of the beautiful, it'd be nice to be able to pin it down to something specific. But that's about as specific as I can make it. That uh, he had that inclination. He thought language was beautiful. Uh, he wasn't afraid to use that word, which most people are. And he had an, the education 
uh, to back it up. Yeah, right. The other thing I noticed in, in reading your book, watching the movie, and reading The River Runs Through It is the book and the movie are, are different, and you sort of fill in a lot of those holes. But uh, I'm curious, like, for instance, the circumstances of Paul's death are different in the movie than in real life. And I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. Well, they're different in The River Runs Through It than they were in real life. And uh, my father took liberties with it in the geography of it, because uh, as he did often, because he didn't want to interrupt the flow. If he had Paul's death happen in Chicago, which is yeah. where it happened, instead of in Montana, which is where it happens in the book, he would have had to explain how Paul got to Chicago. And Paul wasn't there for very long, and he had a job that my dad got him at the University of Chicago uh, publicity office. But uh, that's where it happened. And it happened in a back alley just off 63rd Street. Uh, I've been there to the alley and scouted it out. Oh, have you? Really? Oh, yes. I did a final tour in Chicago uh, at the end of my journalistic career. I was in Washington for 18 years and then came back for a, a few years at the end and made it my business to find out about Paul's death. Uh, first thing I did, of course, was get the clips out of the Tribune. And at that point, the Tribune was transferring everything to some kind of digital collection. And they were getting rid of the, the actual clips oh. that were in folders. So I just took it. Uh, I was allowed to do that, but uh, I got it with all, all the trip clips. And then I kept poking and thought, you know, well, this guy was, <laughs> was murdered. Right. You know, there's a paper trail for murders. <laughs> I'm an old police reporter, and I'm going to go to work on this. And I did. And because I was the closest living relative at that point, uh, I was able to get uh, official documents about it. And I quote from those in uh, Home Waters. And that establishes the bare facts uh, of the murder. There is the apocrypha. There is the surrounding mythology about it. And I've heard things since that book came out. People have called me up and said, oh, boy, you didn't get the story right because your father told a different story. I said to myself, just because my father told a different story doesn't mean I didn't get it right. What I said in that book, I got right. That's how he was killed. But what my father wanted was a better explanation. Because in the police accounting of it, it is a robbery gone bad. And furthermore, there were enough sightings of Paul by different witnesses that you can place him at different places prior to the murder, which happened in the wee small hours of a Monday morning. And you can place him in spots that Sunday night and into the early hours on Monday where he's trying to start a fight and he's drunk. Yeah. And that's in the book, in my book. I don't yeah. say flat out he was drunk, but he was. And you get the idea. The surrounding mythology that my father put out was that it was more meaningful than that. It wasn't just uh, something that he may have provoked, uh, in fact, and it was uh, or a robbery gone bad uh, or a robbery after the fact. You know, he might have gotten in a fight with a couple of guys and after they knocked him out, uh, he wasn't killed instantly. He didn't die until the next afternoon. Yeah. But they went through his wallet and took his cash. They did. Oh. Kind of thing happens. I don't know. Maybe it did, maybe it didn't. But the apocrypha was that it was his gambling debts that caught up with him. There was, in fact, a gang of uh, rough Irish guys on the south side uh, of Chicago, and Paul may have gotten mixed up with them and gotten into debt with them. It is a fact that he was in serious debt. It was a fact that uh, the effort to reform him had failed. Uh, and that he was in trouble. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, that's okay. But you can't tell me that uh, a bunch of Irish guys went out uh, and starting out midnight, <laughs> Sunday night, or later, figuring, well, Paul McLean will be out on the street near Woodlawn and 63rd Street 
uh, or 63rd in the Grove. And if we just wander over there, we can beat him up because he owes us money and kill him. That isn't the kind of thing that happened. Okay. If the, okay. they were going to send heavies after you, they would do it during the week. <laughs> Irish boys don't go out on Sunday night. Their moms don't let them, even if they're in a gang. And they would break fingers or they would right. do other things. They're, they want the money. They're not going to, you know, kill you. Now, if you fought back, that's different mm-hmm. and something can happen. But I don't think that happened. I think that my father invented that to comfort himself in a way that there was, this was a more meaningful event than it appeared to be. Right. Somehow tied to, you know, a whole pattern of behavior that he and his father and Paul had tried to deal with and so on. It was certainly tied to a pattern of behavior. Right. Right. But I don't think it was quite that. Mm -hmm. I don't think it was what he said it was. Right. The whole thing about him, you know, your grandfather asking your dad again and again, tell me about that right hand and the broken bones yeah, in his broken right bones hand. broken bones in his right hand. Like yeah. he was fighting back? Was that what that was all about? Absolutely. Okay. You know, Paul was a, was a very strong person. He was about, weighed about 185, and he was barely five foot eight tall. I mean, and when you look at the photographs of him, big shouldered, big chested. I mean, this wasn't fat. Yeah. Right. But he was strong. Right. Take care of himself. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Huge news, folks. The number one fishing app, and I'm talking trout routes here, has been updated to include the entire lower 48. That's 50,000 streams mapped and classified into four categories and 350,000 hand-curated public access points marked and ready for you to explore. You know, there's nothing more exciting than finding that new trout stream or access point. I'm a huge fan of trot routes because they make it so easy. Say goodbye to stumbling around country roads looking for your next spot because trout routes provides every detail you need for each stream, including public and private bridges, stream flows, trail access, where to park, camping opportunities, boat ramps, and more. No service, no problem. You can save maps for offline use. With trout routes, I've found dozens of new streams and access points I never would have known about. So what are you waiting for? Sign up for Trout Routes today on your Apple or Android phone. Are you an avid angler in search of top-notch fly fishing gear that's easy on the wallet? Well, look no further than Adams Built Fishing Gear. Adams Built is the ultimate choice for anglers who prioritize quality, affordability, and style. Established in 2014, Adams Built has been the trusted companion for thousands of anglers creating unforgettable moments on the water. Seasoned pros and beginners alike will love their lineup of lightweight and durable waders and wading boots, high quality nets and fly rod starter kits, and meticulously designed fly boxes and outerwear. When I first heard about Adams Built, I have to admit I was a bit skeptical. Having run through many pairs of waders over the years, I wondered about their guarantee. So get this folks, all Adams Built branded products are guaranteed to last, and Adams Built waders carry a lifetime repair or replace guarantee. You only pay shipping, hard to beat that. So why not make Adams Built Fishing Gear your go-to choice? Check them out at a dealer near you or at adamsbuiltfishing.com. That's Adam Built Fishing, the trusted source for quality fly fishing gear. You know, I love the character in the movie, obviously played by by Brad Pitt. And, I'm, you know, like some of the scenes about the, I'm wondering which of these are true, like tucking your cigarettes under your hat to swim a hole, the whole shadow casting thing. How much of the Paul in the movie is really, from what you know, his personality and who he was? Well, it's a highly romanticized, but it's uh, it's real. I mean, he he did that. I mean, he was uh, he had that kind of charisma. He was also very rough. So when you read contemporary reactions to him, yeah. handsome as a movie star, I mean, literally the female secretaries at the University of Chicago would go out on the lawn and take their lunches with them to be out there when Paul walked through the campus. <laughs> he was that beautiful. I never get that. I don't know. <laughs> it's never yeah, happened I mean, to he me. He was that beautiful. No kidding. But, you know... It, I'm not going to repeat the things that were said about them. A lot of people didn't like him. Well, if he picked a lot of fights, I could see why. Uh, one yeah. of the one of the the uh, the scenes in in the book is about how he's he's walking through 
the bar with the Indian girlfriend and uh, head sticks out and says woohoo to the to the Indian and then Paul punches the head and the the head and the body are lying on there something like that and it just sounded like it just made me think this guy really is a fighter. Yeah, almost ninety nine percent certain that that's a true story. Yeah. <laughs> you know, there's a lot of storytelling that goes on in the world, but I think yeah. that one is uh, if that, that might have didn't exactly happen. Something like it uh, happened. Right. What about Neil, the brother in law? Is that a true? story? He's a composite character. A composite. Okay. And uh, yeah, that's funny because my father got along beautifully with his brother-in-law, Ken Burns. Ken oh, Burns is one of his greatest friends. Oh, no but kidding. Ken had a couple of other brothers and my dad didn't get along with them. I mean, that, and yes, the things happen. I've talked to that with my cousins and I said, well, you know, I know which one, brother-in-law that was. It was so-and-so. They said, oh, no, no, John. Some of this was him. Some of this was this other guy. Oh, really? Okay. I liked my uncles. They were really nice to me. And right. I'm talking about right. the ones who were used for Neil. They're very personable people. And in the end, they were all reasonably successful businessmen. They were Two of them were CPAs. One of them was an insurance man. The guy who is, I think, is most closely linked to uh, Neil uh, was an alcoholic. And he got into AA and got straightened out and became Good. a pillar of the CPA community on a town on the West Coast and had everyone's respect. And I, I met him once, and he was a charmer, a little too easy, handsome guy. You know, he did all that stuff. He went off and tr tried to take Hollywood by storm, and they loved him. and he played this <laughs> horrible game of tennis, which I was say. did very well in Wolf Creek, Montana, but which didn't go so well when you got around anybody <laughs> who's ever played the game. Wait, what about Rawhide and Longbow? True people? Yeah. <laughs> True people. Really? <laughs> yes. No kidding. Is that place yeah, still Dad there? Dad used to tell that story it, really? around the Burnses. I mean, he would you know, kind of a dinner time <laughs> after dinner story. Is that right? And so oh. it's something that really happened. Uh, he told it with great relish. He tells it so well. And my mother hated it. Oh, really? Yeah, he tells it so well in the book. I mean, honestly, it's just one of the great stories. And I love the, the reason. What does longbow mean? That's a nickname. Drawing the longbow. It's a Westernism. Someone who draws the longbow is someone who tells tall tales. Okay. All right. uh, he's drawing the longbow. <laughs> yeah, right. Rawhide you get. <laughs> yeah, rawhide was pretty easy to figure out. But it, it, so that <laughs> that story is such a classic. And, it, and it's, it takes up a lot of the pages and a river runs through it, maybe more so than, than in the movie. I haven't counted that before. I've been getting, you know, well, thinking about it. I think, yeah, estimating. Right. right, right. So shifting gears a little bit, I'd love to hear a little about Seely Lake and your experiences in Montana with your dad and your family up there. Is, is that where your dad wrote The River Runs Through It? No, uh, it isn't. Oh, it isn't? Okay. He had two places to work. And uh, since I've followed him uh, in some ways in his footsteps on this, it became immediately apparent to me how this all works. What we do at Seely Lake is field work. I've written some paragraphs there, and I've even written a page or two there that have, been, that have survived. Uh, but I've never written a whole chapter of a book. And I've written an awful lot of books. I've written seven books. And, and I spend an awful lot of time at the cabin. That's not what you do there. You use your time there differently. Uh, you use it to go out and absorb and to make notes if you want to do that and to take things in. Then you go back, in my father's case, to Chicago, or in my case, to Washington, D.C., and then things come out. So you have vacuumed all this stuff in and pre-digested some of it but you haven't gone to the finished product. You need to get away from that. Oh, I see. Uh, Interesting. Dad talks about this. You know, he says, you know, some off people, guys need two places to work. I think yeah. a lot of us do. I know I do. Kind and of on site from, in a way. Okay. Yeah, on site and then get, get, away, get away from it here. It's too close there. You're thinking about, oh, how will this affect so-and-so, and he's just down the corner. I'm going fishing with him tomorrow. It can't be like that. Yeah. You've got to get here where I am in my office for uh, – you know, I'm away from all that. I don't have those considerations. Uh, I know what I'm doing, and I'm pulling this thing together. Yeah, super interesting. And he was the same way. And your your cabin is surrounded by some a gigantic uh, forest of lark trees. Is that right? Yes. We are deeply, deeply fortunate. 
The larch there uh, were once all around Seely Lake, and uh, in the early part of the 20th century, there was a huge uh, timber sale, the largest at that time in the history of uh, the Forest Service, and it included uh, all these big old larch trees. They say old, you know, we're talking about anywhere from 300 to 1,000 years old. Wow. Yeah, and there was a, a ranger at the time who was kind of very fairy, uh, but a good guy, and he wanted to save virtually everything on the east and west side within certain corridors. He'll let some of it go forward up in the hills where you don't see it, but he wanted to save those corridors. And he, he wrote a letter to Washington about that that's very flowery and, uh, and nice, and it's in uh, home waters. And they basically fired him, <laughs> moved him to Wyoming where he could do less harm. And the guy who took over was a uh, up from the bootstraps uh, uh, timber cruiser named Jim Gerard. And he was self-taught and was a friend of this ranger. He was a very decent man. But he realized that you couldn't do what the ranger had wanted to do which is to save everything and screw the lumber companies. Yeah. So you got to give them something. So he gave them the uh, one side of the, of the lake, but not ours. And we wound up with a, about a 500-acre larch forest that is monumental. The oldest one there is the number one western larch in North America. Uh, apparently, there are some, or one or two, or whatever, in Siberia that uh, get into that class. But it's it's colossal. Uh, and when you go there and and hug it and put your forehead up against it, you really feel that you're part of, uh, yeah. of eternity. It's a it, no, it's a it's a great thing. How how big is that tree? It is not that tall. They all get up to about 100, 155 feet and stop. So yeah. it isn't height. It's uh, bulk at the bottom, uh, okay. bulk at the top. You know, there's a bunch of things that they measure. It gets a little esoteric. But there are, are gauges for this. Right, right. <laughs> yeah, it's not a redwood, but it's in that uh, giant class. So we have those, and they're, and they're wonderful. But what happened was nobody figured out why they were there for a long time. And the wisdom when I was growing up, uh, the wisest thoughts were that they had been spared because they had uh, water from Seely Lake on one side, mountains on another side that kind of protected them from fire. Uh, uh, the outlet from Seely Lake protected a third side, and the inlet protected a fourth side. So we were kind of yeah. isolated from uh, fire. This is absolutely, completely wrong. Uh, the reason that they grew so big is because the fire was so frequent. The normal fire regime with Western Larch is 75 years, and somebody finally, a uh, fire scientist, did a dendrochronology study on the fire rings and discovered that the fire sequence in this grove is about every 25 years. Uh, and what happened was the Native Americans would camp where we are. It's a beautiful place on yeah. Seely Lake. And, you know, last man out would, you know, just kick the ashes around so it would start a little fire. And when you came back the next year, the huckleberry would be coming up green and fresh and abundant and so on. And they would get one good fire going through there about every 25 years. And when you look at the base of these giants, there are all these cat faces, which is old burn marks. The tamarack, the western larch, protect themselves by having very, very thick bark and by dropping their branches as they get taller and taller. So a fire has a hard time establishing itself in one of these trees. Interesting. It can happen. It does happen. Over the years, the land in the forest around these trees grew up and became very threatening because fire was not being used. It wasn't being put on right. the ground by Native Americans. The Forest Service was trying to put out every fire that ever uh, started. And the whole scheme was wrong. And these things were being choked out. Huh. They couldn't get light, they couldn't get water, and they were in extreme fire hazard. So the Forest Service turned around, learned its lesson, and started doing clearing and getting rid of the ladder trees that go up the side of these big trees and clearing the ground. They need to do it about every 15 years. They did it about 15, 16 years ago, and they're, now they're doing it again in these places. 
Uh, we have a wonderful ranger at Sealy Lake at present who understands all this and is aggressive and is doing a great job uh, of cleaning things up like that. Yeah, good deal. So we still have this stuff. We still were losing them. We lost a big one on our lot uh, down by the lakeshore just this spring. Huh. One of the giants. Uh, the, the lake uh, front eroded to a point where this thing finally fell down, and it's probably four or 500 years old. My goodness. Let's shift gears for a minute here, John, because I do want to ask you about your time as a reporter in, in D.C., because you've covered some really interesting stories. I mentioned some of them in my intro. Can you talk about your, your, your days with... Uh, Henry Kissinger and the shuttle diplomacy and all the different exciting stories you've covered. Well, Henry is uh, turned 100 this year. Uh, yeah. <laughs> he's not Still living. alive. Uh, I can't believe it. Almost everybody. There aren't many of us left who were uh, part of that uh, group that uh, went around the world on his shuttle diplomacy. Bernie Kalb, who was uh, Marvin Kalb's brother, uh, just died this last year. Alas, a wonderful, wonderful man. And a lot of the others have gone, too. I was extremely young uh, when I did that. I was the youngest one uh, of the uh, 14 regulars who traveled with Henry Kissinger on his shuttle diplomacy. Uh, I was in my 20s, and I didn't have any business there. I didn't have a deep background in foreign policy. Uh, all these other guys had spent you know, 10 years in Vietnam and Russia and Middle East and so on. Uh, but I was, and I hustled. Uh, and I did it. I got yeah. on. And uh, Henry and I are still <laughs> going along uh, at a fine old rate, and yeah. uh, a lot of people are not. Uh, it, was a, it was an extraordinary experience. Yeah, I bet. In some ways, you were encapsulated. Uh, you didn't have a lot of uh, outreach beyond the fuselage of the plane with, with Kissinger or the hotel where the conference was being held. and. Uh, you would get briefed by the Egyptians or the Israelis or the Jordanians or whoever they were engaging with. Uh, and that's what you saw and that's what you reported. It was diplomatic reporting, which is yeah. frankly not the world's most exciting reporting. But at the time, we were on the front page of every newspaper in the world. Yeah. Day after day. And what was accomplished uh, when I was along was Sinai 1 and Sinai 2, the two agreements that pulled apart the Israelis and the Egyptians and the Jordanians. And those have held up. If you've been reading the paper lately, the Israelis yeah. are pounding the Palestinians, the Palestinians are pounding back. But that does not involve a clash of armies. There's been trouble on the northern border of Israel with Syria, but not with uh, the highly populated country of Egypt. And you really can't have a, a war against the Israeli without the Egyptians. There's no peace without the Palestinians. There's no war without the Egyptians. Yeah, And Kissinger did that. He got that done. Uh, I, I later covered the Camp David Accords uh, with Jimmy Carter. That was a totally oh, different uh, yeah. ball of wax. Right. And Middle East is most of what I did as diplomatic correspondent. I, I was diplomatic correspondent in Washington for over a decade. And it was almost, it was heavily, heavily Middle East. We don't have that kind of uh, balance, uh, uh, focus anymore in foreign policy. We're now focused on uh, Ukraine and China. Right, and, it's a uh, different world. Iran and North Korea. That wasn't, they weren't on the, on the radar scope in those days. China was. Yeah. I went with Kissinger to China for the oh, did you? Uh, a prep trip for our uh, Nixon visit. Yeah. Hey, so that was when China was just being opened up. Well, it was when China had not opened, uh, it was just starting to, and it was kind of an eerie experience to be in Beijing. You see what Beijing has become, and all the towns and big cities in uh, China have become, where they're covered with uh, industrial pollution and air pollution from cars and, and so on. That wasn't the way it was. Uh, there was a certain amount of industrial pollution, but not a vast amount. And the streets were dead quiet. Oh, strange. I mean, it was eerie. You know, you'd get up in the morning and, okay, it's rush hour, and you'd look out and there'd be lots of bicycles and people walking and people doing that uh, kind of Tai Chi uh, exercises on the on the pavement. And where did this scene come from? I mean, this right. isn't modern life. I think we're all a lot better off when it was like that. 
How much access did you have to Kissinger? Did you get to know him as a person? A lot. He uh, played the press like a violin, <laughs> and we were part of his uh, repertoire. And he would have these, when we were doing the shuttle diplomacy, going back and forth, say, between Jerusalem and Cairo, that was a regular route. We'd get on the plane. You didn't know what had happened in the place where you'd stopped. You know, you didn't have a very clear idea because, you know, battle up, time to go. Let's go. Let's go. Get to the plane. Then he would say, okay, it's time for you boys to come up to the front. Uh, we had one woman who was an occasion, occasional uh, ad on Marilyn Berger from the Washington Post, but it was, it was guys. So we'd go up in the front and sit around a conference table uh, with Kissinger, and he would brief us on what had happened. And his take on this was, you guys have got to listen for the nuances. Huh. You've got to listen for the subtle changes in what I'm saying, because I'm not going to lay it out for you. You've got to pick it up. And when there is a subtle change in the wording, that means it something, means something. went on. Yeah. And it's up to you to figure out what it is. That's what diplomatic reporting is. Yeah. So we would all listen to him, and then we'd go back, and then we'd have to write our stories while he went to sleep. And then we'd have to file our stories and while he went to sleep. And he got more sleep than we did. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. <laughs> we did our right. jobs. But he couldn't leave us alone. Yeah. It, no, he liked it. And he, yeah. he just loved the back and forth in the game. And when I talk about the Cal brothers, I saw them at a bar mitzvah here uh, a year or two ago. And uh, we got together and we were talking about the old days and all that. Uh, I kind of had to introduce myself because I don't look that way anymore. I was in my 20s. I'm not in my I, I'm not in my 20s anymore, Steve. How old are you, John? Can you tell us? I'm 80. <laughs> You're 80. Okay. Uh, all right. And uh, we got talking about it. And he said, oh, yeah, we were talking to Henry the other day. And then they imitate his, yeah, uh, right. his accent, which everybody <laughs> except me tries to do. Yeah, and they've you. got it. And... You know, that guy is 100 years old, and he's still writing books. Is he really? But they were still in huh. touch with him. Huh. And when you, if you want to know what happened uh, on the flight, you go back and look at the books that the Cal brothers wrote and Dick Valeriani's Travels with Henry. Valeriani got a lot of us to give our notes and clips and impressions and so on of what it was like to be on shuttle diplomacy with Henry Kister, wrote a book about it, and a uh, very good one. Uh, it's a first reference. It's a basic reference. But he, it was a thing. And, you know, we were our own little world. There were 14 of us and uh, commanded the world's attention year experience. after year. What an experience. It was, uh, something else, yeah. Yeah. We just got a minute or two left here, but I wanted to ask you about your kind of your second career writing books on, on wildfires and, and then home waters. How did that come about? Well, I put 30 years into the Tribune, and I was still very young. I was 52. I did everything a little too young, yeah. but I got away with it. And the River Runs Through It had come out, and the movie had come out, and I'd been in Chicago for about three years after that, which was lucky. Uh, I was lucky I wasn't in Washington because there was a lot of estate stuff to deal with. But I had run the gamut. I'd, you know, I'd run the string out at the Tribune. And I could have stayed there and would have been kicked out in time because that yeah. uh, is what has happened with newspapers. But I wasn't kicked out. I left on my own steam. Uh, I got out when they were still paying us to leave. <laughs> oh, nice. There you, <laughs> you go. Know, Smart well, man. Well, we'd, we'd like to you know, get rid of a couple of people. We'll just have this quiet little buyout. and It'll be rich. You're raising and your so hands. So I took it Pick and me. <laughs> I was able to get a, a contract to do a book. And the contract finalized. Uh, the, an auction on it finalized the same, almost the same hour that I resigned from the Tribune and took the buyout. Oh my gosh, how about that? The f story was about the South Canyon Fire uh, of 1994, whose anniversary was yesterday. 30th anniversary was yesterday. And I put up a couple of pictures from it on my Facebook account and it had something like 280 hits Already, I did that last night, late last night. Oh, you did? Okay. Uh, a very famous fire, uh, a sister fire to my dad's uh, fire, the Man Gulch Fire. Man Gulch Fire actually saved lives on the South Canyon Fire. Eight smoke jumpers uh, went into shelters and sheltered up when the fire hit, and they would have been in dire straits if they hadn't been in the shelters. And the shelters, of course, come right out of Man Gulch. 
uh, and the foreman wagged Dodge's escape fire, which is how he survived, and which led to the survival of the two others, uh, Bob Sally and uh, and Hellman. No kidding. Okay. I said Hellman. That's not it. Do you enjoy writing, you know, books as much as you did being a uh, correspondent? Much more. I, I, I've, it, it, I've loved writing books and oh, okay. being out. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I'm, it's comparing apples and oranges. I had. I, I like my journalistic career. I'm very happy with it. But uh, this has been what I really wanted to do. Uh, I like being on my own. Uh, I don't like gang journalism. Even when it's good, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. I've always wanted to write about the West, uh, and I've done it. Uh, I've made an independent name in fire writing. That took years to do, uh, and I have earned and worked very hard for uh, the respect of the fire community, which is a pretty hard-nosed community. Uh, and I'm I really value my relationship to that community. Yeah, it's very important to me. You know, in some ways, I'm a comma. And I understand that, you know, John McLean, comma, whose father wrote A River Runs Through It. And, and I accept that. Uh, that wasn't the case when I was a journalist. I was right. just me. Right. But I've had this added thing, and it's fine. I wouldn't be here today. I would, couldn't conceive of having done what I've done without my dad and his books. It wouldn't have happened. Well, this book, Home Waters. I love your book, Home Waters. You're an excellent writer. Um, I don't need to say that, but, you know, I, I, that was my take when I read it was, boy, this is fantastic stuff. Just as we're closing up, I, I wanted to walk walk us back to River Runs Through. I'm going to read the last paragraph to you because I kind of want to know what you think about this. It's beautiful. Another amazing paragraph of American prose, in my opinion. Eventually, all things merge into one and a river runs through it. I get choked up even just reading this. The river was cut by the world's great flood and runs over rocks from the basement of time. On some of the rocks are timeless raindrops. And I can't even talk. Under the rocks are words. And, and some of the words are, there. are theirs. And then he says, I am haunted by waters. And it's just like, ugh. What do you make of all this? Uh, I think it's uh, almost miraculously perfect. I remember the first time I ever read it, I got to the end of it, I thought, how did he do that? Yeah, such a tough guy. It lifts you, that last page just lifts you up and carries you along and leaves you in exactly the right place. Yeah, I mean, was your dad, I'm haunted by waters. I mean, did he go through life just haunted? What was that about? But it was about Paul, I'm guessing, by reading the book. But was he haunted all his life? Was it, was it guilt? Was it regret? What was it? When you figure that out, you yeah. have earned your right to go fishing on the Blackfoot River. <laughs> okay. Okay. And you can figure it out. Right. And it's it's kind of in the book. I mean, it, it to me, it seems like there's a theme of helping people that don't want to be helped, but that they want people that don't want to be helped still want people to try to help them. And maybe that was Paul. That was certainly Paul, except he did want to be helped. He just didn't want to be helped in the right way. Ah, so interesting. All right. I always ask my guests this question, uh, going back to the, the Blackfoot. You spent a lot of years out there. You got any off the beaten path, you know, local places for people to go grab a sandwich and something to drink at the end of the day, uh, fishing the Blackfoot or the local rivers? Well, if you haven't been to Trixie's Saloon in Avanda, Montana, <laughs> okay. you haven't been to the beating heart of Is northwestern right? Montana. <laughs> yes. I've not been there. I have to check that out. Right off Route 200 and... When you get there, take a look uh, back uh, to the west and okay. think about Glacial Lake Missoula being there and then the progression where it receded, the river was left there, and then you can see the Indians coming right along where you just drove. That was the spot. And then you can see Lewis coming along that same path. That all happened there. Right there. And then you can see me and my dad <laughs> driving along that on our way to fish the Blackfoot. Yeah. Have you been to Ekstrom's at the base of uh, Rock Creek? No. Oh, you have next to the Merck, the, the famous fly shop there? That's a great spot. That's my, one of my favorite places in all of Montana to have breakfast. It's fantastic. 
All right, we've given away two great places. There we go. There we go. All right, John, thank you so much for being on the show. Loved having you. Thank you for having me, Steve. I appreciate it. Yeah, you bet. Listen, I wish you extraordinary success in all your adventures to follow. And folks, thank you for listening. Hey, John has already sent me a bunch of great pictures that I'll be posting on the Destination uh, Angler uh, Instagram and Facebook pages. As always, you can DM me or email me with your comments and suggestions at sheg50 at gmail.com. If you like the show, please share it with a buddy. As always, our music is by a Brothers Fountain. Hope you join the show. We'll see you again soon. Tight lines, everybody. Well, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go, I'll go From the land to the shining sea But I know, I know, I know, I know There's more to life than what the eye can see